Welcome back to another Space News Rundown with me. Lots to talk about this week. We've got three orbital launches from around the world to look back on, a whole host of Starship updates to cover, and some very exciting launches to look forward to over the next seven days. So let's get right into things, beginning, as always, with all the latest updates with SpaceX's Starship. I guess we can break down Starship updates into four categories for the moment. Updates for Stage 0, updates for Stage 1, updates for Stage 2, and then a quick summary of all the other things like other prototype vehicles and other things going on. That last category I guess is not as specific as the first three, but moving on anyway. Beginning with Stage 0 updates, we saw work continue on the so-called chopsticks, which are the two massive metal arms that'll catch the Starship and Super Heavy when they return from flight. and. Of of course will also be used for stacking the rocket without the need for a separate crane which was what SpaceX used to stack Ship 20 and Booster 4 during the rocket's first fit test. The chopsticks are now attached to the tower completely unaided so the tower does appear to be taking the entire weight of the system without issue which is of course a good thing. The arms actually moved a little bit on Thursday during a test of their side to side hinge movement which again seemed to go without a hitch. On Tuesday SpaceX conducted a fit test of the hydraulic actuator, which of course will be used to operate the movement of the chopsticks. I know we're all pretty much used to the idea now, but I still remember when we first all saw Elon's tweet that SpaceX were going to try and catch the Super Heavy booster with the launch tower arm using the grid fins to take the load. This was less than a year ago, and I remember it seemed absolutely insane at the time, but now we're actually seeing this monster get added to stage zero. These are very exciting times indeed. As mentioned, SpaceX are currently using cranes to do all the lifting of spaceships because the chopsticks aren't ready, and currently SpaceX are primarily using rented ones. However, a new SpaceX-owned and branded crane arrived at the site last week and was quickly assembled. This is not a rented crane, it's owned by SpaceX, and I think its black and white paint job looks brilliant, especially compared to the colourful Franken crane, although I do have to admit I do like the janky appearance of that. <laughs> Looking at the launch tower though, the catch arms aren't the only appendage that we can see attached. The other arm that's attached to the tower is the QD, or Quick Disconnect Arm. While it will provide some stability to the stacked rocket, its function is primarily to fill the Starship and Super Heavy with fuel and will need to be able to quickly pull away from the rocket upon liftoff, hence the name Quick Disconnect. We saw SpaceX conduct some tests of the motors that operate the arm last week with the tests looking to be successful. After I published my video last week, I did actually get some comments from people wondering why there was even a need for the orbital launch table, you know, the stand that the rocket sits on, given the fact that surely the catch arms can just hold the rocket and then release it to let it take off. And the reason that this isn't the case is because while the arms will be capable of lifting the rocket and the Starship for stacking, during this operation, both vehicles will be completely empty and not filled with fuel. And of course, both will have comparatively very little fuel upon landing. When fully fueled, there is no way that the tower will be able to support their massive weight, which is why they need to be sitting directly on a launch pad. Just thought I'd add that clarification there in case anyone was still wondering that this week. Now moving on to updates for Stage 1, or Super Heavy, the current vehicle in the limelight is of course Booster 4. Last week the biggest news we saw was the arrival of some aero covers that'll shield its external pressure vessels, and we also saw engineers install heat shielding around the skirt to protect the rocket from both the heat generated during re-entry, and of course from the heat of the Raptor engines themselves. The latest Raptor to be brought to Booster 4 for install at least at the time of me writing this bit of the video, is Raptor 57, which of course was one of the engines used for the Booster 3 static fire. On to stage 2, Starship 20 had all three of its sea level Raptors installed and all three of its vacuum Raptors installed last week. After the success of Ship 20's static fires just over a week ago, I'm hopeful that we might be treated to a full triple engine static fire test of the sea level and or the vacuum Raptor engines, which of course will then mark the first engine test of a Starship with all all six engines attached. While we're on the subject of Raptor engines, we had a few updates for the test campaign of Raptor version 2, which is the next evolutionary step for the Raptor engine over the current V1 engine that we've seen so far. Not a great deal is currently known about Raptor 2 at this stage, but we do know from Everyday Astronaut's interview with Elon that it will look much more simple than Raptor 1, resembling this bare Raptor 1 in design. Last week, Elon tweeted that the Raptor 2 reached 321 bar before rapid unplanned disassembly during an engine test, but noted that the cause may have been due to the oxygen inlet being at too low a pressure rather than being related to the engine itself. The tweet here doesn't explicitly state that this particular test fire was Raptor 2, but a follow-up reply from Elon 
mention that Raptor 2 has a thrust of about 245 tons at 321 bar, confirming that this is indeed in reference to a Raptor 2 test. Now, the 321 bar refers to the pressure experienced by the combustion chamber of the engine. The current record holder for the highest chamber pressure is Raptor 1, which during a test managed 330 bar without any failure back last year. To give you an idea of perspective, the next highest pressure operational rocket engine is the Russian RD-180, which has a pressure of around 267 bar, and it's currently used for the first stage of the American Atlas V launch vehicle. I'm looking forward to seeing how Raptor 2 turns out when it's eventually complete and ready for flight testing. Beyond Stage 0, 1 and 2, Starbase itself is expanding rapidly. The Wide Bay, which is a bigger version of the current High Bay, is really starting to spring up, and once this is complete, it'll allow SpaceX to build Starships and Super Heavies even faster than they currently are. Not that they're being particularly sluggish at the moment, though. Looking at Brendan Lewis's latest diagram, you can see that Ship 21 and Booster 5 are coming together amazingly well. And photos from the ground back this up, as we've seen lots of shots of Ship 21 pieces complete with TPS tiles looking very clean and polished. The test tank B2.1 was also rolled to the booster test stand last week. Right now, it's not exactly clear what SpaceX want to test with this prototype so far, but I imagine that it'll become clear over the course of the next week or so. So I guess I can talk about that some more in next Monday's video, and all the other updates that'll inevitably happen over the course of this week. I'm leaving my coverage of Starship there for now, and now must explain excitedly transition to the next segment of the video where we go back and look at all the other rocket news from last week but before we do that guys you know i've got to shamelessly ask you to like the video if you are enjoying it so far it really helps support the channel and of course i always do appreciate it anyway let's roll that transition <laughs> Last week, on the 26th of October, we saw an H2A202 launch from the Tanegashima launch site. On board was the QZS-1R navigation satellite, an upgraded replacement for the QZS-1 satellite. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, the company that builds and operates the H2A rocket, tweeted that it was a really beautiful launch, and from the footage, I would have to agree with them. The satellite is an advanced experimental GPS satellite and was successfully placed into a tundra orbit, which is a kind of highly elliptical geosynchronous orbit. Next up, on the 27th of October, we saw China launch a Kwaizu 1A from the Zichang launch site. On board was the Jilin 1 GFN 02 F21 satellite launched for Changguang Satellite Technology. This Earth observation satellite was successfully placed into low Earth orbit and is now fully operational. Finally, on the 28th of October, we saw an old reliable Soyuz 2.1A launch from the Baikonur launch site. On board was the Progress MS-18 cargo spacecraft launched to resupply the International Space Station in support of the Expedition 66 mission aboard the station. The vehicle was successfully docked to the aft port of the Zvezda service module on the 30th of October and it'll remain in orbit for 215 days. Now, aside from those launches, we also had some very interesting news from Blue Origin. Yes, they announced that they were working with Sierra Space and last week released some very exciting plans for a new space station. The space station will be called Orbital Reef and it's being described as a mixed-use business park, giving anyone the opportunity to establish their own address in orbit. Orbital Reef is backed by space industry leaders and teammates, including Boeing, Redwire Space, Genesis, Engineering Solutions and Arizona State University. We currently have two space stations in orbit, the International Space Station and the Tiangong Space Station, but this one will be a little bit different because it'll be commercially owned, developed and operated. The modern looking space station will have large earth facing windows and it'll have comfortable living, working and recreational spaces. This space station could be operating by 2030, but I think we do need to manage our expectations somewhat, considering Blue Origin's history of over-exaggerating their timelines. Either way, a space station that aims to be capable of hosting non-specialist crews is exciting because it takes us one step closer to making space accessible for every human, so I will be following this story with the utmost interest and excitement. Anyway, that's a wrap on all the news from last week that I wanted to talk about, but we've got some very exciting launches to look forward to over the next seven days, so let's talk about those now. The first launch of the week will probably be the most exciting one, as it's another Crew Dragon launch. Yes, on the 3rd of November, we get to see the SpaceX Crew-3 mission fly aboard Crew Dragon Endurance. This mission will send four astronauts flying to the International Space Station from the Kennedy launch site, and the crew will consist of three NASA astronauts, Commander Raja Chari, Pilot Thomas Marshburn, and Flight Engineer Kayla Barron, and there'll also be ESA astronaut Matthias Mora on board, who is a payload specialist. 
This flight was supposed to launch on the 31st of October, but just like last year, it seems that Scrubtober has reared its ugly head and pushed the flight into November due to unfavorable weather over the Atlantic. This mission will be the first space fight for everyone on board, except for Thomas Marshburn, so hopefully Crew Dragon will be a smooth ride for them. Also on the 3rd of November, we'll see China launch a Long March 2C from the Chuquan launch site. On board will be two Ye again reconnaissance satellites, which will be placed into low Earth orbit. After this, on the 5th of November, we'll see Astra make a fourth attempt at getting their vehicle Rocket 3 into space. It's a shame that their last attempt went a bit more sideways than vertical, but the second attempt of at the vehicle almost made it all the way to orbit, so I'm remaining optimistic that Astra can finally pull it off this time. Finally, on the 7th of November, we'll see JAXA launch an Epsilon rocket from the Uchinora launch site in southern Japan. This mission will be part of JAXA's innovative satellite technology demonstration program, and the rocket itself will be carrying nine technology demonstration satellites. These will all be to test designs and ideas that have been put forward by universities and private companies, and hopefully fruitful results will be achieved by all. Anyway, as it happens, that's the final anticipated launch of the week, which wraps up not only this segment of the video, but the video itself. If you guys made it this far, then thank you so much for your support, and I really do hope you enjoyed the journey. If you could be so kind as to leave a little like for the old algorithm, then I always do appreciate it. And hey, if you want to support me even further, like the lovely folk whose names are scrolling on the left, then you can do so by signing up to my Patreon via the link in the description or via the one that's on screen. You might notice some of the users in the comment section below have cool badges next to their name. If you'd like the same, then you can join the Loun Squad by hitting the join button underneath the video. And if you want to check out more from my channel, then there are also two video suggestions on screen. One of them is from my second channel, and I think you'll like it. It shows me nearly getting hit by cars for about 20 minutes. So what's not to love? Anyway, bye.